it's Christy, and I'm doing this video basically inspired by the debate that I had yesterday with uh, Carl Benjamin Sargon of Akkad, and he and I are in preliminary talks to have another debate, this time on the topic of patriarchy. One of the things that came up during the debate is that Carl hasn't sat through a sociology course, and, and he's never done a, a degree scheme in the social sciences, and yet he's criticizing them based on no experience, no direct knowledge of what happens in the classroom, not even understanding kind of what the pedagogic goals of the courses, like the course I taught, are. And there's an also other problem on YouTube that there is not a lot in the way of social science information out there. There's a lot on the hard sciences, but there's not on the social sciences. I'm making this to explain the ways in which social researchers, social scientists, investigate the world, and why we do the things we do, why those things are valid, and why our conclusions are valid. This then is, I'm going to try to keep this uh, under 30 minutes. Students are quite happy and prepared to sit for an hour in a classroom, but YouTube isn't really designed for that. So what I'm going to try to do is break this up into sections and go through the first part of it today, and then I'll continue on in later episodes. So let's get going. These slides are just taken from my directly from what I used to teach the course. The publications that informed this lecture in particular, but were the were Bryman were was a core text of the book. Burr also social constructivism and Moses and Torbjorn were also um, cited a lot in this particular lecture. What is the job of social research? Well, basically we want to address one of these three questions. Actually, it's sort of like four questions or three and a half questions. The first contribution of social research might be to describe what is happening, describing a phenomenon for the first time, or describing a phenomenon in a new context, or describing a new phenomenon observed in a place where it hasn't been observed before. That is going to answer the question, what is happening? We would refer to this as descriptive analysis. Another question that we can look to answer is, why is it happening? What is causing things to happen? This is a causal analysis. Finally, we can ask, how can we make better things happen? Or how can we make things happen better? That is to say, if we're examining a policy outcomes, we might want to examine, are there more practical, efficient ways to do this policy um, implementation? Or are there ways to improve the process to get better outcomes? Those are normative analyses, because the attempt there is to improve or make things better. Now these three questions can be answered using either quantitative or numbers or approach or a qualitative uh, language-based approach. The difference is the way we think about the questions, the methods to get our answers, and how we then interpret our results. So in this lecture, I'm actually going to do the first two and not do the third. Um, actually, I think, yeah, yeah that's right, uh, the first two and that, not the third. The, we're going to focus on ontology what exists and how can things exist? How does a social world exist? What does that mean? Epistemology is focused on how can we know accurately what exists. And then after that I do a, a history very condensed of the philosophies of science and social science, but that will be in a part two video. Grix in his book The Foundations of Research lays out these building blocks of research. Ontology is the first and most fundamental thing that you have to address. What is out there to know? What exists? And how does it exist? The next question that follows on is, once you think something exists, is how, uh, what and how can we know about that thing that we think exists? Methodologies are the ways about in which we go about acquiring valid knowledge in order to um, be able to say, this is how I know about that thing that we got from our epistemology. Methods are the ways, the procedures that we can use to acquire it, and the sources are the data that we intend to collect. That data might be in the form of language and focus groups, or it might be in the form of experimental results in the lab, or it could be the result of survey data. Those could be our sources. Ontology and epistemology are connected. And that's how I'm treating them in this um, particular lecture, because 
one in your position on the, on ontology will then inform your epistemology how does the world exist and in in our case as social scientists we want to ask how does the social world exist we want to ask how do we come to know what exists and then we want to know which methods should we use to try to evaluate our theory and that depends on how we perceive the world so the first bullet point is a question of our ontology the second a question of our epistemology and the third is a question of methodology ontology coming from philosophy and um, you know you can do an entire course i'm sure on issues of ontology epistemology in philosophy i didn't have that much time i had one lecture to try to present this information to my students and then use it as the building block for the entire rest of the course. But from philosophy, ontology is an explicit formal specification of how to re represent the objects, concepts, and other entities that are assumed to exist in some area of interest and the relationship that holds among them. The bare bones is ontology is an attempt to answer the question, what exists? And an extension of this question, we can then go on to ask, what is existence? What does it mean to say that something does not exist? What is an object? Can one give an account of what it means to say that an object exists? These are very you know, big questions, but for the purposes of, of this research, and I want to also include here not just the scientific approach, which most people will be familiar with. I'll actually do another, um, I'll do the lecture that I give on quantitative so, um, social science another time, but this time I want to set up the qualitative side to sort of differentiate between the different approaches that we can take. So in terms of ontology and the discussion of reality, what does it mean to say that I'm talking about reality? Burr, in her book, provides three different definitions of what reality can mean used in the ontological debates. It can be reality is truth versus falsehood. Reality is materiality versus illusion, or reality is essence versus construction. If I were doing a philosophy course here, we could spend a lot of time discussing competing notions of ontology and how things exist ultimately. We could go into monism and dualism. However, in that class, I didn't have that much time, so we limited our discussion and description of ontology and its application to the study of social phenomenon as essence versus construction and in the sciences you might be looking more at you know what might be true based on a null hypothesis versus what can't be reject rejected and you'd have to accept the null hypothesis these are two different ways of doing science and because this was a qualitative lecture i was really setting up this idea of essence versus reality and but also sort of picked up by burr Continuing on with the notion of ontologies, this is asked um, when we're discussing ontologies, we can ask the question, actually, and in, in, in propose the question in two ways. Are social entities objective entities that have an external reality to social actors? Or are social constructions built up from the perceptions and actions of social actors? And I don't think that these are mutually exclusive. Allow me to give an example. If we say, and we know from observation that the, the older you are, the more likely you are to vote. We could say that aging is a sort of an independent objective process that has an external reality that shapes people's political behavior over time. We know from, again, observation and testing the data that people in their, you know, when they first get the right to vote, they might get not be that interested, it doesn't really seem that important to them, then they get a job and they get an apartment, they're paying taxes and it starts to become more relevant or as they get out into the workforce, they have children, suddenly they have a school board, you know, that they can vote on, um, they're interested in having when their garbage is picked up, so they start voting in local elections, they start voting in school board elections, they start voting more often in national elections, and this is a process that even though people aren't consciously aware of it, we see happening again and again and again. This implies it's an independent external force that is shaping people's political behavior. That is one way that we can think about the social processes um, that we want to study. On the other hand, 
something like party identification. That social construction is built up from the perceptions and actions of the social actors. What does it mean to say that you are a supporter of the Labour Party or the Conservative Party? To say that you're a Democrat or a Republican? How do people understand what the meaning of the party is? And why does, they, why does that give them a sense of meaning? What values do they think they're expressing when they go to the polls and vote for that party? So, in other words, for our purposes, in terms of that class that I was teaching, ontological claims are claims and assumptions that are made about the nature of social reality, claims about what exists, what it looks like, what units make it up, and how these units interact with each other. And as I said, I don't think there's a right way to do social research. I actually think it's better to use a multiple series of approaches in order to understand both the external realities like aging that have an impact on our lives, but also the social construction that people give to their actions and their, their perception of their society that then also influences their behavior. That's why I'm a big fan of mixed methods approaches and why I think it's important that we have really robust research design and findings in both our quantitative and our qualitative research. Before moving on, one of the, the quick word about terms. Part of the challenge in getting a grip on these ideas is that people in different books use different terms. Bryman used, for instance, objectivism and constructivism. Grix used foundationalism and anti-foundationalism. Burge talked about social constructionism to approach, to refer to a set of approaches to study human behavior. And my advice is if you are going to read any of these authors, just make sure that you read their definitions and have uh, what you think is a clear understanding of how they are employing the terms when you go ahead and read them. A foundationalist or objectivist approach taken up um, and described by Bryman says that reality exists independent of our knowledge of it. I get back to the process of aging on vote choice, right? As I'm getting older, I'm not really thinking about the fact that you know I'm worried about my social security benefit now and that's going to make me inspire me to pay more attention to which candidate is going to do a better job on social security for instance and it impacts everybody the same way it's independent uh, of our knowledge of it and it exists so quoting here from Hughes and Sherrock true knowledge must rest upon a set of firm unquestionable indisputable truths from which our beliefs may be logically deduced so retaining the truth value of the foundational premise from which they follow. Or to quote Ryman, another way of thinking about this ob objectivist approach is to say, or objectivism, social phenomenon and their meaning have existence independent of social actors. Aging has an independent an impact on my life regardless of how I think about it and it impacts all social actors you know, in, in similar ways. Anti-foundationalism or constructivism does not think that the world exists independent of our knowledge of it. Instead, reality is socially constructed by actors, and there are no central values that can be rationally and universally grounded. Bryman writes, the researcher always presents a specific version of social reality rather than one that can be regarded as definitive. Knowledge is viewed as indeterminate. Allow me to present an example. When I did my research in 2010 on the British election study, I talked to four different voters who all said that they were open to voting for the Liberal Democrats even though they had voted for a different party for basically their entire lives. 2010, they were really you know, ready to make a change to either vote, you know, to vote tactically or to, to vote for a different party to give somebody else a chance. And when, they, when I talked to them afterwards in the focus groups, they describe this process of being undecided, even going up into the, the ballot box. One, three of the four sort of made their decision right as they were holding the pencil in their hands. And they describe this feeling of it just not feeling right to vote against the party they've always voted for before. And so they ended up, even though they said they were going to vote for the Liberal Democrats or were completely open to voting for the Liberal Democrats, two of them went home and voted, you know, went home to mama, sort of, went, uh, you went back to the Conservative Party, and the, um, the man went to vote for the Labour Party, which is a party of long-term identification. Now, just because I have those observations in that instance doesn't mean that in a different election cycle, something else 
would cause them to cross that line and vote for that different party. So I can't speak definitively as to what people will do in the in the polling and the voting booth when they have a, a long-term party identification and they have an option to vote for a new party. I can, however, describe the psychological discomfort that those people describe to me in going against what they've always done, in violating their cognitive consistency. There's no test for that that I can use. It's not like I can get their age and predict that their likelihood of, of doing this or not. This is something that is a, their specific version of their reality. But what you can say is if you've got people in Colchester displaying, Colchester, England displaying the same behavior as people in London, and two conservative voters describing the same process as a labor voter, well, this is, you're starting to get at some knowledge here, some kind of interesting phenomenon that's going on, but I'm not claiming any sort of big deductive truth claim from it. It might be difficult to understand how something can exist and not exist. How can you have a social reality without looking at it or seeing it or feeling it or touching it? And yet we have a really perfect example of our producing social realities all the time. If you just think about when you go to pay something in cash, what makes a dollar worth a dollar? What makes a five pound note worth five pounds? It's not because there's an inherent intrinsic five pound noteness to that piece of paper, or there's not an intrinsic dollarness that there's more, there's 10 more dollarnesses in a $10 note or bill than there is in a $1 bill. It's just, as the headline says, a symbolic mutually shared illusion. So this is from The Onion, one of my favorite papers. And um, I'll just go ahead and read this, right? U.S. economy grinds to halt as nation realizes money just a symbolic mutually shared illusion. The U.S. economy ceased to function this week after unexpected existential remarks by Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke shocked Americans into realizing that, in fact, money is just a meaningless and intangible social construct. Quote, through, though rising interest rates is unlikely at the moment, the federal, the Fed will, of course, act appropriately if we, if we, said Bernanke, who then paused for a moment, looked down at his prepared statement, and shook his head in utter belief. Quote, you know what? It doesn't matter. None of this, this so-called money really matters at all. It's just an illusion, a wide-eyed Bernanke added as he removed bills from his wallet and slowly spread them out before him. Quote, just look at it. Meaningless pieces of paper with numbers up, printed on them. Worthless. Now, money is worth money because we agree it's worth money. And we believe it when people say, oh my gosh, the value of the dollar just fell. Some people decided that the value of the dollar just fell, so it fell, and we accept it. That is the social construction of reality. That is an intangible social construct. However, if that happens and the cost of importing oil suddenly jacks up to $4 a gallon or $6 a gallon, that has a real-world impact on people's lives. And this is the connection between intangible social constructs and the way that they can influence and shape not only individuals, but communities and entire countries. It's hard to grasp, but this is the thing that social scientists are trying to understand. These unobserved things that happen, we see the effects of them, right? Because the causes of them are often in the minds of people. And trying to get at what is happening inside the minds of people can be done both deductively and inductively. The ontology that you adopt will influence the kind of questions that you ask, the epistemology you take up in trying to answer your question, the methods that you'll use to investigate and try to come to an answer, and how you're going to interpret your results. Let's think about this from a perspective of human sexuality and the way that people sometimes conflate the physical with the social. One might say that it's common sense to think of sexual behaviors being the result of the drive to reproduce. So our sexuality is really bound up with the process of procreation. From this point of view, men and women's sexual behaviors lead them to different roles in the evolutionary process. Right? So this is sort of an evolutionary psychology attempt to account or 
characterize men as promiscuous and the justification for that is spreading their genes whereas women are supposed to be monogamous and that's because they want help providing for you know they want a stable relationship in, in the raising of, of their children evolutionary theories might underpin what is natural so in terms of sexual selection, sexual pressures, the way that mating um, rituals in different species come along, all of that is what we consider part of the natural world. But human beings, of course, have a social world. And in that social world, a lot of societies have conflated what happens in nature, what is natural, as being also what is normal or what is the most common or the most acceptable behavior. And not only to say that that is an, um, a quality, it's an essential quality. That our sexuality, that um, procreation is actually an, an essence of our sexual activities. And therefore, if you do anything, if your sexual behaviors are such that they don't um, map on perfectly to the goals of natural species continuation, you're now abnormal. And because of this conflation of the natural and the normal, there are moral connotations that then get put onto sexual behavior. And this influences um, you know, how people think about sexuality, the social attitudes and factors, and not only biology. And that's why it's important to understand how as social scientists, we try to unpack what is happening in a society and how it is linked to the physical world, what is happening in the physical world, and how that influences things. So it really does require some thoughtfulness in terms of understanding the causal drivers and also the difference between what is ontologically material in, in its existence and what is ontologically a social construction, like moral norms around sexual behaviors in its existence. Epistemology asks what is or should be regarded as acceptable knowledge in a discipline. Now, from the positive, positivist approaches, what can produce knowledge about which we're positive about in the world, there are the quantitative methodologies, the use of surveys, experiments, and statistical analyses. You can also look at methods of um, getting to knowledge through the constructivist or interpretivist approach. That's qualitative methodologies using focus groups, interviews, and the analysis of text and language. There isn't a right way to study the social world. We could study, and we do, study the social world using both the quantitative and the qualitative perspectives and allow me to show you how you could construct a study using both that would complement each other. So our ontology, what we think exists and how we think it exists, will influence the epistemological perspective of what, of, of what we use to study the social world. If we're interested in evaluating how patriarchy operates in different societies, we could start off with the idea of what it is to have be, you know, what is patriarchal, what is a patriarchy? It's a family, community, or a society based on a system where the father is the head of the family and men have authority over women and children or are governed by men. So there's a lot in here to unpack, right? Pa because patriarchy is a big concept. <laughs> it can be used at the family unit level. It can be used to describe a situation where by the social, cultural, religious norms of the day, the man is seen as the authority, is the person in whose body authority rests and everyone should acknowledge that and his decisions take precedent um, he can tell people what to do and he's also held responsible sort of for the any moral failings therefore it falls to him to correct any moral failings in his family you can have patriarchal communities you could have and there are many uh, religious communities in an otherwise secular country where men are conceived as seen as the head of the household but above that the men of the church or the men of you know the mosque are con are considered to have authority over other men and those families so the entire community is structured in such a way that male voices at every level have power but within those male voices certain men have more power over other men and are other men are subordinate to and must obey the higher the man on the food chain and then there are also times when you have societies that have disproportionately um, always had men in them uh, maybe it was an exclusively male 
career or like like politics or medicine, law, the, the bigger ones, and those it's institutions of power, justices, legislators, uh, you know, executives have been men since the beginning of time. Are have all the norms of male dominance, and even when women enter into those physical spaces, maybe they get elected, nothing really changes because even though women's physical presence in the legislative body or in the governor's office or on the bench might change that particular situation, it hasn't really changed the whole structure that has been built up over time. So there's a different levels upon which we can think about patriarchy, or if you want to look at it from what we would call a multi-level analysis, you can have the micro level of the family unit, you can have the meso level of the community unit, and you can have the macro level of the nation and do statistical analysis on each of those and look to see what are the big factors that predict a highly patriarchal or a low patriarchal society. To study patriarchy, therefore, we could go out and try to determine where and how patriarchy works by measuring, by operationalizing the concepts and then measuring the level and ex extent of patriarchy. We could even create a patriarchy index and rate nations on how the extent to which patriarchy um, exists in their societies and also if it's in the private sphere or in the public sphere. Alternatively, another way to look at it is to understand how people understand patriarchy. Why do people think that it's valid in order for, uh, for a man to always have the right to make the decisions in the family because he's the man? What's the legitimizing basis of that? Or why do you defer to your religious male leaders on these issues? Or what does it mean to operate within a legislative body where, like the House of Commons, when a woman gets uh, MP got up to make a speech, men on the opposing side just started chanting, uh, melons, melons at her, uh, pointing at her breasts in order to silence her. What does that mean to them and how do they operate within that system? You can't do that kind of research using surveys. You need to talk to people. Therefore, using a qualitative approach, you would interview people and try to understand what patriarchy means to them and how they operate within that system. Both approaches entirely valid and also when you have these two findings together, quite complementary. Now, in the next bit, I'm going to be doing what I call the breathless review of the history of knowledge with lots of bits left out. And I think this is a good time to sort of draw a line under this initial lecture because the next section is really long and it needs to be done in a block. I hope that thinking about uncovering social facts and thinking about the social world Maybe you've done this kind of training before, you've had this in a class, maybe you've read some books and this seems familiar to you, but I think that there's a real lack of critical thinking about how things happen in the social world. And in order to address that, I wanted to put this out there so that people can understand and learn. And one of the things that we should try to learn from philosophy is that it's good to understand where your opponent is coming from and the strengths and weaknesses of their arguments. And again, as I, I think I said at the beginning, if, if Sargon and I are going to debate patriarchy, then it's going to be important that he understands these terms because I'm going to be using these kind of nuanced approaches to the description of the social world the ontological differentiation between a foundationalist and an anti-foundationalist approach is going to be part of my worldview. And if you don't understand that, then you really can't critique what I'm doing. Well, you can, but you'll just sound dumb because you haven't actually done a valid critique of what I'm doing. And doing a valid critique is actually how we move conversations forward. So using buzzwords and um, you know using blog posts that don't really have any depth, yeah, it's it's a way to get views. But if you're if someone is really interested in making a decent argument, and I would love to see from the anti-feminist side some really decent arguments, the first thing you have to do is understand and accurately represent what your opponent is saying. Because if you can't point out validly the, the flaws in their arguments, then they, they're just not going to quite take you seriously. The other thing too is just to understand how social sciences under, look at and also respect the amount of work it takes 
to do investigations in the social world. It's very, it uses the same approaches as the physical sciences, but people are way more complex. People are way more complex, and we have to account for the various ways, the various things that move them, not just survey-based data, but also that social construction of their understanding of their political identity, or their understanding of what it means to be a member of their nation, uh, what it means to be British, what it means to be French, what it means to be Australian, what it means to be Ugandan. These things are social constructs that aren't easily got at accurately by just taking a deductive theoretical down, you know, theoretical model to hypothesis approach. All right, guys, that's going to be it. Hope you enjoyed your getting your geek on for this Sunday. I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Um, oh, you know what? Okay, see you. Goodbye. And then uh, for those of you who are interested in the channel stuff, stick around. So for those of you who are just here for the um, slides, thanks for watching. Bye. Three, two, one. All right. So for those of you who are just want a really quick channel update, I wanted to let you know that I didn't get out as much as I wanted to for while I was in Pisa. However, I did do one important thing. And that is, I finished the entire book, Did Jesus Exist? It's done. It's dusted. I've read it all. I, I know all the chapters and I understand all of his arguments. What I want to do now is, as I said before, take the time to do an introductory video where instead of reviewing his book, I basically give what I wish he would have done in the book. I'm going to give what I think are the arguments I find most credible in terms of uh, questioning the assertions, the, the questions I think are the biggest and the most damaging that are left out by mythicists that cannot be answered with the available data, and why I think the available data that we have when we look at possible explanations for that data, an historical Jesus makes far more sense as a probable explanation than mythicism. But that's going to take me a little time to crowd, but just an FYI. The other thing is I've got a couple other ideas just for short videos. The video I was going to do today, besides the one before I decided to do this one, is um, if if sin is, is kryptonite to God, I want to do a video on that. And um, yeah, facepalm moments. I'm a little bit behind on those. So more content as ever from me coming up. I hope you guys are looking forward to it. Hope you enjoyed this. And yeah, have a good day. Have a good night, whatever it is, wherever it is you are. I hope it's a rockin' awesome day. Talk to you guys later. Bye.